Hello, everyone. My name is John Lustry. I'm the Director of Education at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, joined today by Dr. Allison Johnson. And today we're going to, going to be talking about her uh, recent book. It is out, correct? No, it will be out in May. Forthcoming book in May, uh, entitled The Left Armed Corps, Writings by Amputee Civil War Veterans. Uh, it's a really, really, really cool volume, uh, an edited collection of letters, uh, writings by Civil War amputees. Uh, and we're gonna get into the process, what that was like, the editing and what the collection is and all that in just uh, a little bit. But I wanna say uh, to get started, of course, thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate that. It's always a joy to have people here watching with us love to hear where people are watching from and 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 all that sort of thing and if you have any questions during the program go ahead and drop them in the comments and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can if you enjoy our videos and want to support us an easy simple and free way to do that just hit the like button and hit the share button share it either to your timeline or send it to uh send it directly to someone that you know might enjoy it uh, any number of ways that you want to do that always help us out. If you want to take your support to the next level, consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Membership starts as low as $25 a year, and it supports programming like this. So if you decide to become a member and support us in that way, uh, we'd be very grateful. You get all kinds of benefits for that. In addition to the knowledge that you're supporting, great videos like this. You get free admission to the museum for a whole year, discounts uh, in the gift shop. Great excuse to plan a trip out here to Frederick, Maryland. Uh, you can come visit the museum for free and do all kinds of other exciting things that this area has to offer. So uh, we'd love for you to consider doing that if you can. But today we're going to be talking about uh, left-handed penmanship contests and all of the very surprising uh, insights that they reveal to us about Civil War medicine. Um, so a shout out to anyone, if you're like me, I am a lefty, so uh, I'm especially excited about this. Are, are you a lefty, Allison? I am not, and only 10% of the population is, so left-handed people are very unique, and in the 19th century, it would have been more like, <laughs> it would have been more like 2% because of you know, the, the stigmas against sinister, which is the Latin for left, um, the, yeah, that's where we get the word sinister. Um, very interesting. Yeah, and dexterous, which means, you know, you're very uh, good with your hands comes from the, the Latin for right. So the sinister left hand with the stigmas against it was less, even less than it is now. But you should be proud of your left handedness. Oh, I, I very much am. Um, so yes, this goes out to lefties everywhere. If you're uh, if you're left handed, go ahead and let us know in the uh, <laughs> in the comments. Um, so We've had you on before, uh, but for those that maybe didn't catch that, uh, I'd encourage you to go back and watch that video either on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. Um, but for those that didn't catch that uh, episode, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, reacquaint our viewers with uh, what these left-handed penmanship contests were, uh, the left arm core, how you came across it and, and all that sort of thing. Okay. So this whole project started, well, I mean, it all probably started with watching Dances with Wolves when I was a kid and seeing uh, the beginning, the opening scenes of Kevin Costner's character trying to resist getting his leg amputated. And so my pro parents probably shouldn't have let me watch it. I was only like six at the time, but it was very formative. And I wanted to know, I was fascinated by, you know, what made amputation so horrible? Why was he willing to like ride his horse in front of a, a line of Confederate soldiers rather than get amputated? So I feel like that kind of started my, my interest or planted a seed about wanting to know what it was like to be in that, that tent waiting for um, your limb to be cut off. And fast forward to undergrad, I went to UC Riverside um, and wrote a thesis about Civil War poetry and then went to uh, UCLA for my PhD and uh, wrote a dissertation about bodies and wounds in Civil War literature. And so part of my research trip was going to the Library of Congress. And I hadn't gone with the Bourne papers in mind. I was there and I was looking through the Civil War collections 
And one of the librarians who also let me see Walt Whitman's walking stick, which was really cool. I couldn't touch it. But they brought it out for me. Um, they mentioned William Olin Bourne and his papers and said, oh, you should really look at these. These are a great resource for, because uh, I was looking for writings by Civil War soldiers. So in, at this time you could still access, this was back in the aughts, back um, uh, almost 20 years, well, I don't know, it was, would have been in like 20, uh, 10, 20, 2009 probably. So you could still access these papers. Now they've all been digitized and, uh, but I was getting to hold them in my hand. It was pretty awesome. Um, and so born in 1865, having spent a lot of time in volunteering in the Central Park Hospital in New York City, had witnessed a lot of uh, veterans returning from the battlefield minus an arm or with a very diminished arm. And he would have many of those veterans sign his little, like basically the equivalent of an autograph book. And next to some of the uh, entries, so they were where they were saying, you know, thank you for all your writing very flowery praise for Bourne and thanking him for his help. Um, he would write written with the left hand and then sign it W O B. So he was beginning to recognize this unique group of veterans who had lost their right arms or lost the use of their right arms and were learning to write with their left hands. So he decided to hold a left handed penmanship contest. And he held the first one in, um, in 1865, and then a second one about a year later, and had an exhibition of the, for, of the first of the specimens that, um, that, that the veteran sent in. Um, and for the first one, he offered premiums. He offered prizes for each of them. For the first one, uh, he offered prizes for Ornamental penmanship, which was an art form at the time, especially popular among men who taught business penmanship, which was a subject in school that you could learn. And many of the veterans would took those classes so they could um, obtain employment. But that was really Bourne's, one of his main um, arguments that he used to sort of bolster and talk about why he wanted to do this, this contest was that these men might not be able to engage in manual labor anymore. Many of them had been farmers prior to the war, like many or most Civil War soldiers. Um, so even if they couldn't push a plow, they could use a pen. And so the penmanship contests were intended to uh, illuminate the, the sort of occupational options that were open to them, even though they, they couldn't go back to their, their lives before that. So there were the two um, penmanship contests, like I mentioned, and then, uh, and I wrote about those in a chapter in my, my first book, which was an edited version of my, um, my dissertation, which is the book I talked to you about, uh, talked to you about about a year ago, The Scars We Carve. And then I decided I, I really wanted to create a collected edition because Bourne had hoped to create, to publish a collected edition. He kept on promising it and in, the news, in his newspaper, The Soldier's Friend, which was a publication to help veterans um, and became the, one of the mouthpieces of the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, he constantly said, we, you know, we hope to publish a memorial volume if we get enough subscribers, if we do this, and it, it never came to fruition. So I really wanted to, uh, to do that. And luckily my, my editor, um, James Long at LSU Press enabled me to do that. So that's how we got to the second, the second project. Um, but one thing about the second, the second contest is that he, Bourne asked about 10 generals and admirals because Farragut, Farragut was also, he was the, the one non-general um, to sponsor, to pick the winners. So they each had their premium. So Grant had a premium, Hancock had a premium, Meade had a premium. And they each wrote letters to the, the men they had selected. So when I was in the Library of Congress, I actually got to hold the letter that Grant wrote that he, he sent to, I believe his premium was for Caleb Fisher. Uh, and when Fisher moved to LA, when he was a widower, like late in his life, they published in the LA Evening Express an article about his, how he still had with him that letter uh, that Grant had written. 
So it's fun to see that the 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 legacy of of they 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 remembered for the rest of their lives that they were oh and you asked about the left arm four that was uh, sort of their their that's the way that the some of the members referred to themselves born addressed them as the left arm core it just became kind of their a name for this unique group of veterans yeah what a cool story and especially that's a really neat tidbit that various generals and stuff had their own kind of awards that they gave and they wrote individually to the winners that's really neat uh, Something that jumps out to me, you know, you, where kind of Bourne first gets this idea for the contest, he spent so much time in the hospitals and he's kind of seeing this. And that seems to be a common thread with a lot of Civil War medicine. Well, a lot of the Civil War story in general is like suddenly Americans are in this newfound proximity with other Americans, this kind of very close relationship with all kinds of things that inspire them then to do other things and civil war medicine, especially to be in such proximity to those that are either suffering or those that need care. And then you start to wonder, well, what can I do about it? This is certainly something that motivated Claire Barton, for example, when she sees wounded soldiers from the sixth Massachusetts, many of whom she knows personally, she says, well, I need to do something to help. And so born seeing this close up, maybe I can do something to help these people. And it's, I think one of the things that's actually really inspiring about civil war medicine, the way that it inspired some of these people to action by being kind of up close uh, with some, something as serious as all this. So I think that's just a really cool little tidbit I wanted to highlight. Right, yeah, well, it's just cool to watch him sort of realize that this is a important subset of men. Like he's interacting with lots of different veterans but he's, fo he's zooming in on this, the, well, what are these guys gonna do? Because they, they lost, some guys lost their left, their left arm. Yes, that is difficult, but really the right arm, what are you going to do without it? And I just wanted to say, I misspoke. Caleb Fisher won the Sherman premium. And so he carried Sherman's letter with him to LA. Got a good, uh, good clarification there. Um, Quickly over in the uh, the comments, we have uh, at least three lefties uh, tuning in, Suzanne, David, and Sarah. Um, so welcome, my fellow left-handers. Um, and then we also have one of our regular viewers, uh, Fernando, watching from Venezuela. It's always good to have Fernando uh, watching with us. So that's really neat. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We appreciate it. Um, you mentioned your former book, The Scars We Carve, and, and we talked about that previously. Um, I like asking people this sort of question because very rarely, I think it does happen sometimes, but very rarely do authors, you know, just kind of write books that are totally and completely unrelated from each other. So I wonder if maybe you could talk a little bit about how your first book kind of influenced uh, this forthcoming volume. I mean, obviously you had the chapter on it in there, obviously mm -hmm. that informs it, but just kind of the way you were thinking about this sort of thing, how that kind of moved you forward. Well, it was a, it is a different type of book in that, you know, a dissertation and then a scholarly monograph is one thing, but then an edited collection where the primary, uh, the primary writers are not going to be me, right? I write the introductions to every, the, I write a biographical introduction to each veteran and the larger introduction and, and had, had tracked everybody down and did all that work, but Really, my husband even joked when he was like, well, is it really your book? Because it's mostly the veterans writing. I was like, well, thank you, dear. But um... <laughs> hey, gotta, gotta love that. I love that. And, and yeah. actually, as you're kind of talking about this, uh, maybe you can say a, a bit about how you organized this as well, because as right. you said, it's, you know, it's a, a, edited letters, there's an introduction, but maybe talk about how you set about organizing it too. Yeah, well, so I think one of the reasons that Bourne didn't publish all of the writings is that it would be like 4,000, it would be really, really long and it, the, to include every single, so there were 333 contestants total, which maybe doesn't seem like a huge number, um, but it's a lot of writing, it's a lot of pages. And initially he had said, you know, we, we need, we want it to be two pages, over two pages, but less than, but fewer than seven pages. And then eventually he's like, no, that's fine. You can write more than that. And some people wrote like 20, 30 pages of handwritten, you know, so it's a lot of writing. So um, obviously when I when I was writing my chapter about the, the contest, I was like, you know, it would be really, really great if 
uh, to, especially because, you know, scholars in the past had said things like, we'll never really know how these, these left-handed papers fit into the larger um, Civil War literature canon. I was like, well, well, we can try though, right? And I, I mean, I started to do that in my chapter, but also I was like, well, but if we, if I actually can collect a large number of these and present them in a way that, that kind of tells a story, then maybe we can begin to understand um, how these left-handed writings fit into the larger re literary record and historical record of the war. So that was part of, uh, and I just kept, but I also just kind of had to learn, like I looked at a few other collections. There's one by Christopher Hager that is a collection of letters. Um, I think it's I Remain Yours, or I think that's what it's called. Uh, and just looked at, and, and, and there are definitely letter, collections of letters. So I kind of looked at how people organize those, um, but realized that there were some thematic commonalities between these. Obviously, every, they're all required to talk, they have to identify their regiment and their company. They have to tell uh, born their enlistment date their discharge date, uh, where they were wounded, where, when, they, um, when the amputation occurred. And so everybody, a lot of them start off with their enlistment date. They're almost all of them, maybe except for three or four of them are volunteers. So only three were drafted. And that's pretty impressive out of 333 men. Um, so they basically, they often start with the enlisting. And so my first chapter is like, okay, well, I'm gonna talk about the process of mustering. So they're, they're joining up and then also just marching because so much of it is just describing where they're marching to. And um, it doesn't make for the most interesting reading, I'm sure for, but so sometimes I kind of condensed and would, I, you'll, there, there are kind of italics that indicate I'm interpolating and saying, okay, here they, they march from Frederick, Maryland. Frederick, Maryland gets mentioned quite a bit uh, <laughs> uh, to somewhere else. But so, the, so just like the process of becoming soldiers. So going from civilian life to soldiers, that, that's a major theme. Um, they're also, you, the, Bourne asked them to kind of um, talk about their experience of battle or they could talk about their experience as soldiers. And so some of them, my second chapter is called The Soldiering Life, where some of them just like include fun tidbits or anecdotes about, uh, and it's weird to say fun. I mean, but there, one of them says, you know, it's good to show the, the, the delights of soldiering life so, to, so as to emphasize the horrors, you know, they kind of, they, to, um, and so he tells us, just, one of them tells a story about how they have to cross a river and uh, one of their, the lieutenant, falls on his butt and leaves an imprint in the mud on the other side. Or one of the guys, they hear that Richmond has been, um, has fallen, it's wrong, it hasn't at this point, but they're, they're really excited and they're celebrating. And one of the guys grabs his pants to like in celebration and the, the seat of his pants comes away because it's shoddy, it's the horrible material. So there were just these, I was like, these are really great stories. How, how do I, um, so I wanted to put those together and that that becomes like the kind of what's it like the daily life of the soldier and sort of anecdotes um, of the soldier. And then of course, many of them talk about their battles. So either the battle where they were wounded, interestingly, some of them don't talk about the battle where they were wounded. They're talking about, you know, my first battle. Um, then some of them do, then another, another one will say my last battle and talk about his wounding. And I have a chapter on wounding, amputation, and recovery, uh, which I'm sure would be interesting to, to you and to, your, to the, our listeners, uh, just because obviously they, that is a, a, a hugely consequential experience in their lives and the reason that they're participating in this, um, in this contest in the first place. So I began to see ways to organize it. And I also noticed, well, there's, there's about, you know, there's, um, I can't remember the exact number, but there's a large number of new Americans, which is actually the title of the chapter, new Americans, uh, of Germans, Englishmen, um, Scottish, Scottishmen, Irishmen, who are, uh, who come to the country either to enlist or they came before and then they, they fight for their adopted country. 
So there were just ways to kind of organize it rather than just saying like, okay, here's just a, a huge group. I mean, I could have, I could have done that, but it wouldn't, and, and maybe that would have allowed me to get slightly more um, of the, the writings in, I'm not sure. But it, that was an interesting experience because, you know, when you're, when you're writing a scholarly monograph, you're like, okay, here's this aspect of my argument. Here's this aspect of my argument. So instead I let the, I let the, the left-handed papers speak to me. They told me where they needed to go. And so there's, a, there's a, another chapter on poets. You know, they wrote the, the ones who wrote poetry and they're the guys that I talked about in, my, uh, in the scars we carve. And then a chapter on politics, uh, philosophy and patriotism because one, the, one of their options was to write about patriotic themes. Many of them, or quite a few of them talk about reconstruction and the place of um, the freedmen in, in the new nation. Um, two of, two of the vet, only two of the veterans, unfortunately, are, are members of the United States Colored Troops. So they definitely talk about um, the position of black men in the army and, and um, the the plight of, of the freedmen after the war. And then the final chapter is called Life as One-Armed Men, which is focusing on, which focuses on the veterans who, who emphasize what came after. So what came after the battle, uh, what kind of adjustments they were making. That's where some of them talk about uh, amp, their, their prosthetics that they obtained, though not a, though not a lot. Um, and you know what the, their occupation, you know, what kind of occupations they're going to find, how it how it influenced their families, things like that. So feel like it 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 hi the way I organize it hopefully highlights some of the major commonalities and kind of makes it like a representative of the the contest as a whole. Even though I couldn't include a ton of stuff that I I wish I could include. So I'm hoping for a second volume. Fingers crossed. And uh, we can't wait to talk about it when that volume, uh, when or if that volume comes around. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense organizing it thematically, kind of as you suggested, because as you mentioned earlier, it's it's a pretty large body of letters and uh, trying to grapple with how you might organize that is, is no small thing. So that makes sense. And it makes it a bit more sort of user friendly if you're curious about a specific aspect of this story, or if you're curious about the whole thing, you can read the whole thing. And uh, well, I also had to make an index in like a, a week. So <laughs> yeah, well, I had a very short turnaround time, but the index index should help. And then there's also um, one thing I'm very proud of is the appendix. There's two appendices, but the first one is the list of contest, the full list of contestants. So even if I couldn't include them in the their writings, I include them, their their birth and death dates, when they enlisted, when they were discharged, when they were wounded, uh, and their hometowns. And that took me forever to find all of that information about uh, about all the veterans. But I'm at least happy to include all of their names. So they're all they're all in there even if they're not, their, their writing is not in there. That's great. Uh, and we got a, just popping over the comments quickly, we got a question from Carol uh, asking if this will be available to rewatch. Uh, yes, if you have to leave early or you came late, this will, once we finish the live broadcast, will continue to exist on the Facebook page. And eventually uh, within the next week, we'll be on our YouTube channel as well. And maybe uh, when the book comes out in May, if you get a copy of that, maybe you want to read the book and then rewatch this then at a, at a later date, you might, uh, might enjoy that. And, yeah, buy the uh, book and then I can do a second volume. <laughs> exactly. So if you really enjoy this and you want to show that a uh, second volume should come around, go ahead and buy the book so that we can have uh, Allison on again. Another small clarifying point uh, from Michelle Kroll over at the Library of Congress and friend of the museum. We we're talking about the premiums that the generals gave. Uh, the grant premium was won by B.D. Palmer. So uh, yes. there you are. Yeah, Speedy Palmer, uh, I should I should have remembered that, but he also, you know, he died very young, unfortunately, like I think he was 38, but in all of his obituaries, it mentioned the 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 grant premium. Um, and and his his obituary, he was from Lawrence, Kansas, and it it appeared everywhere in and his writing is in the book, is in Left Arm Corps, uh, and a picture of him as well. Nice. 
And it's uh, always good to hear from uh, from Michelle over at the Library of Congress. She is uh, a delight. So thanks well, for tuning I love in, the Library Michelle. of Congress. I am so grateful to the reading room um, people who who directed me toward this collection. Absolutely. Can't thank them enough for that and a myriad of other things. Mm -hmm. So splendid. I wonder if maybe you could talk a little bit about what the process was like actually editing the papers. I mean, these are people not writing with their dominant hand in, in most cases or all cases. Was the handwriting especially challenging to work through? I mean, 19th century handwriting is sort of notorious for being a little, little challenging at times. Was it especially bad? You know, you spoke a little bit about to abbreviating for brevity, but yeah, talk a little bit about that if you would. Right, so I, I mentioned that the, the papers have been digitized and so it's part of the Library of Congress's amazing by the people crowdsourced um, transcribing project and there's tons of cool projects that they have where you a, a citizen can participate in um, transcribing and saving these, these papers for posterity. Uh, and so I was, when I saw that they were up, I was like, excited but then I was like oh no somebody else is going to want to pub publish a copy I got to do this um the thing is luckily I am a lot not to toot my own horn but I'm a lot better at reading 19th century penmanship than the majority of the people who were transcribing <laughs> um because it is hard some of them are hard to read even even if it's um, the majority of the penmanship is much better than anything any of us no offense to anyone listening but I'm pretty sure that it's the majority are better than anything we could produce. And um, yes, there were some that were harder to read. And there are some words that I just had to write illegible. I can't, I can't tell what this is. Uh, but for the most part, the handwriting is extremely um, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, I can show a few, a few examples. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so this is Frederick R. Cutler. This is the tran this is the um, this is the crowdsourced uh, transcription page. He's talking about his stump smelling very offensive, but you know that that's pretty good. This is this is pretty nice. Yeah, I was um, gonna say uh, from some of the stuff that I've seen, that's uh, pretty darn good. I, yeah, I've seen can... I've seen much worse. I'll never forget my first time at the Library of Congress getting ready to do research. And they brought out a, a and I had never really seen a primary source before, um, you know, like the original. And they set it out in front of me, and I had like a minor panic attack. I was like, "Oh my gosh, I, I just I can't read this. My days as a historian are over before they began." <laughs> and thankfully for me, the 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 first thing I happened to see was especially bad, <laughs> and like yeah. I turned the page and it got better. But um, my life wasn't over as I knew it, uh, but point being, I've seen much worse than uh, than some of these. Yeah, these aren't even some of the the best, these, but these give you like a general idea. I mean, you can tell that that it's slightly slightly sloped to the left, um, and that was something that when the the contests were ongoing, soldiers would write and say like, "Are you going to judge us if our based on the slope of our you know the dominant right hand slopes to the right usually?" Um, and and Bourne said. We're, we're not, we're just judging on, on legibility and, and business penmanship. So as long as it is legible. So you can see it's sort of slanted. There are exceptions though. So Lewis A. Horton lost both of his, um, his arms and he wrote with his mouth. So his was difficult to read. Um, then there's John Bryce. This is probably, the, this is, this is, he was harder to read. This is him describing how he felt on chloroform. And he's also mm. included in the book. He, he thought that he saw General Mansfield when he was um, on when he was taking chloroform. So this is probably, you know, the one of the 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 worst, sorry John Bryce, but one of the 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 worst. Usually it's more like this. It's more legible and and so and and quite a few of the men um, won prizes for ornamental penmanship. So I think the 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 image you used to advertise the talk, that's um, Alfred Whitehouse who had extreme, who won a prize for ornamental penmanship and it was amazing, his was amazingly legible. But in terms of editing, so obviously they don't have spell check standardized, spelling is not as standardized as, as, it, as it is now. Um, and I had to decide, you know, am I going to silently correct some things 
or am I going to, I want to, I don't want to remove the flavor. So like one, uh, one veteran, Curly Levon Brimmer, he hit most, almost every word was misspelled. Um, and some of his grammatical choices were interesting. So I decided to keep it. I just kept his, his writing the way it was. I didn't insert, you know, the little sick indication to show that it's his. I just noted in my introduction that, um, some of them I, I edited like very silently, putting a comma or adding a period. Others, I left the original spellings and um, because I didn't wanna lose the, the flavor of this Indiana farm boy writing uh, about his experiences in the war. Uh, so you'll see some interesting, um, some interesting spellings and uh, grammatical choices. Some guy, like one guy just didn't use any periods. <laughs> so <laughs> that made it slightly difficult. Um, and with the, the Library of Congress's um, support, and, and actually they, they, they suggested I do this, I did do a transcribathon with my students. Um, we helped, the, the, the campaign for the left arm, arm cord, that, that it's all finished. Um, but my students like had a very hard time reading, deciphering some of it. And I think a lot of it is that, you know, when, when I was going through and, and finding the guys I wanted to include, it was clear, you know, it helps if you are familiar with Civil War stuff, you know then what a misspelling of Gettysburg is. Like if you, that you gotta know some of the things and that will, if you're not familiar with the, the right, common- to, to know kind of what they're trying to go for. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That gives you kind of a leg up when you're trying to figure out did they just spell this wrong or is this a totally different word? Right. Um, there is one, I, I, I had to admit defeat a few times and just be like, I have no idea what this word is. I think maybe it's brownies. Like one guy's talking about um, volunteers at the hospital giving them food. And he's, I think he's writing brownies, but then I tried to, I was like, when did brownies become a thing? And I couldn't verify that brownies existed. <laughs> yeah, I think just the the unexpected things that like you you weren't expecting to come across and, mm -hmm. and suddenly you find yourself on these rabbit holes. That's right. Hilarious. So I, I almost that. included a footnote saying, I think this is brownies. I, I found a recipe for brownies from the 1870s. Maybe this is brownies, but I, 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 I didn't. Um, but yeah, in terms of uh, abbreviating, I when it just became extreme, so much of it was like, we marched here, we marched there, we marched. And so I just decided I want to include as many guys as I can but to keep costs down, we can't have this be a 400 page book, right? Um, so I would, I did sometimes just um, use an ellipsis and then write, you know, Reynolds regiment moved from here to here. If, it, if it, he had spent like an, a paragraph or so talking about, about that. And sometimes I just had to leave stuff out because, you know, the focus of the chapter was on experiencing battle. Uh, some of the guys appear in multiple chapters um, just like, you know, one, one of the most, um, prolific contestants who contributed to both contests and was known as a soldier poet after the war, Phineas P. Whitehouse, who also has an amazing name. Um, he's in like three chapters because he wrote poetry. He wrote articles for Bourne's paper about the, his, ba the battle. Um, and so I took pieces of, of different things. But yeah, I'd say I just have it, it. If you have the experience of reading these old documents and kind of, and which I had had that experience from working on this with my previous book, I think that helped a lot. And I was able to use like to you at least use some of the transcriptions that people on the internet had had provided, and then go through and correct them. And and um, so again, I'm very grateful to the Library of Congress because I didn't have to like start from whole cloth like, or if that's the word, just like start from, from nothing. I thought I was going to have to sit and transcribe everything, but instead I just could, could use some of those transcriptions as starting points and then be like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. And so I, I painstakingly took a long time. This book makes, when I think about this book, it makes me tired, but that's, that was, that was true of my other book too. I feel like that's what, how, you know, you, you did a good job or not a good job, but you worked hard enough as if you feel tired thinking about it. Yeah, I, I have not written a book, but I, I did a, um, um, not a dissertation, a master's thesis. And, you know, I, I found that plenty exhausting. And so I just have 
immeasurable respect for someone that can put together a whole book. And that certainly sounds labor intensive, even though you didn't start from, you know, square one. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I love asking people that that question who have done an edited collection like this, because I, I think in terms of specifically decisions, whether to kind of edit spelling and grammar and stuff, I don't necessarily think there's a right answer. I just find it interesting, you know, what people decide and how they how they came to it. I just think it's interesting for I typically um, for the the blog here at the museum, because usually it'll only be a couple things I actually usually do just kind of correct the spelling and, and the grammar just for clarity's sake because it's a brief article and you know for the ease of people kind of going through uh, but I'm you know I would never tell someone that's the unequivocal right way to do it I just I love yeah. hearing how people make these decisions and and I think that's a great a great point that you lose a little bit of the character and, and specifically I'm sure some of them had some some phonetic spellings, which give you some clues to 19th century language and pronunciation, which is, is itself pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And Tetum spelled A-N-T-E-A-T-U-M. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Gettysburg spelled G-E-T-E-S-B-U-R-G. I think they got the Berg part right, but yeah. So I just wanted to, I'm really invested in, you know, like, um, memorializing these veterans and, and, and getting their voices um, or preserving their voices. And so I, as if it was just like one misspelled word, then I, I, I corrected it. But if it was, it will, if it was a ton and a lot of grammatical stuff, but I, I wanted it also to be readable. So that's why I sometimes had to add some periods. And I, right. I include that in a footnote. I just say punctuation edited, <laughs> just so people know that some of it is me. Um, yeah, and and I think that's the role of a good editor. You make yourself known when th it's the right time to do so, and you just kind of let it go when it's time to let it go. It's a, a tough balance to to strike, and uh, sounds like you were very very thoughtful about how you struck said balance. I tried, yes, and and that's the goal. Uh, well, we, we've alluded to this a little bit. I want to maybe get into it a, a bit more. Um, of course, several accounts of the soldiers who were wounded and had a limb amputated. I'm sure they had a lot to say about it. Um, you know, oftentimes at least it's, I think a lot easier to give the perspective of the surgeon doing the operating uh, because they're, we know where to look for those people. Whereas casualties of the civil war are faceless and nameless to us in a lot of ways. They're just large numbers often. And so it's, certainly not impossible, but I think generally more challenging to find a like a patient's perspective. And this mm -hmm. is a really interesting ready-made group of, of patients who talk about this sort of thing. So I wondered if maybe you noticed any commonalities in the woundings or the amputations or what they had to say about them. And uh, certainly a few kind of good quotations I think would be of, of great interest to us. So maybe talk some about that. Yeah, so while some, guys, you know, sort of just, and then I got, you know, and then I was wounded and, and then they move on. Qu many of them do talk about the actual sensation of what it feels like to be hit. And I did my best to, um, if they didn't t explicitly say it, like to figure out where exactly they were wounded. So um, was it in, in, in the medical and surgical history of the civil war lists almost all of them. And so you can see if it's like the upper third um, or the, of the humerus, or if it's a forearm or, or, or the wrist. Um, and if they had a circular or a flap amputation. So the circular, the flap is, you, is leaving a piece of skin to cover over the stump, whereas the circular lets the stump heal without covering it over. So some of them talked about things like that, um, but I didn't see um, any trends in terms of like one being more common than the other. Uh, what was common is sort of that initial moment of wounding where they uh, immediately know they need to like get off of the battle. <laughs> they need to they need to go to the rear, um, and they're not happy about it. Obviously, uh, but one you know George C. Buck Bucknam. I'm just looking at him. His entry. He says you know well he's hurt by a premature. Uh, he's he's in the artillery, and so his gun prematures through the carelessness of one of his men, he says. Um, and so he says, 
It blowed my right hand off above the wrist and three fingers of my left hand and burst the drum of my left ear and burnt my face and knocked me down and jarred me considerable, but left me sensible. So I got up and walked off the field one and a half miles to the rear for I couldn't wait for a stretcher and I knew I had no occasion to stay and let the Rebs gobble me up. As soon as I got back to the rear, the doctors began their butchering the same as they were used to. And I was soon a man with a few hands and less fingers than I had two, two hours before. Um, so he's very, He's very straightforward about it. You know, he doesn't, he, he refers to the milk and water doctors who like, um, or, you know, cut and then cut some more and then cut some more. A lot of the, a lot of them praise their surgeons. Others say things like, this is the one surgeon who I didn't see shirk his duty through drunkenness or laziness. I mean, they have mixed, there's mixed opinions about, about the medical care they receive. Some of them write, um, defenses of the hospitals um, and say, you know, we get better care here than, I, than we would get at home. And they're very praised, they praise the Sanitary Commission a lot. Uh, the Sanitary and Christian Commissions, they're very grateful to them. Uh, but the, Joe Bucknum, he talks about how vermin infested his wounds. Like that is what some of them, they don't shy away from talking about the, the kinds of components of wounding that you probably are not seeing in Civil War movies, that the, the maggots and the, the infestations. Um, they talk about, some of them say they didn't have uh, chloroform. Some just got whiskey, which I think is the kind of common conception. You know, they take a swig of whiskey and then bite on something. But quite a few of them did have chloroform. Um, and some of them, talk about, well, some of them had amputations in, in Southern uh, prisons uh, or had to wait until they were paroled. So one interesting thing I found is I, I this isn't, yeah, in the, in the appendix, it lists the day they were wounded and then the day that they had their amputation. Oftentimes it's like a month or two months or a week or a year. Sometimes there's two amputations because they are the exit. So an excision, which is the removal of a part of a bone. So, you know, the, we all, I think everybody who's listening probably know mini balls cause a lot of uh, problems and, and spread. And so if you have an infected part of bone, they re would remove part of that, but then that could get infected and require an amputation like a month later. One man, Lewis E. Klein, refuses amputation and instead wants them to treat his multiple wounds and um, he returns to St. Louis and uh, says he, there's a biography of him uh, that says that he entered the care of the best surgeons in the West who told him, quote, he was a badly mutilated man, almost beyond the help of medical school skill and that his only hope lay in his own force of will, end quote. So for the next two years, twice every day, he had to get treatment from a surgeon to dress his wounds. This is how anti-amputation he was. Um, he even accidentally broke his arm, his right arm when he was walking around trying to obtain employment. And so he basically had open wound, he had these wounds for the rest of his life. And finally in 1905, he traveled to San Francisco to, to try to get some more medical treatment and his wounds got infected and he died. So some of them die years later after their, their wounds. Their, the, the most famous um, example of this, and Sarah Hanley Cousins talks about this in her Bodies in Blue, is Joshua Chamberlain, right, who is suffering from his wounds for the rest of his life. But many of these guys, they have, uh oh, I have two cats who are playing. Um, many of them uh, do suffer from these wounds or you can see in the medical and surgical history it's like the the stump is is painful even in 1870 or they die of um like sometimes the obituaries say that okay sorry <laughs> there are new... we're, we're very yeah. pro cat here at the museum yeah. they're getting to my, my my resident cat is getting to know my foster kitten i thought if i closed the door they would just go crazy but they're they're having some fun hopefully um, anyway, uh, some of them, their obituaries would say like, you know, the, the sickness settled in their wounds and that's what eventually led to their death, death or they con contracted tuberculosis during their service and died of it in their thirties. Like all, as I went through, it was always sad because I, I 
wanted to find out what happened to each of the 333 contestants. So it's always sad to find out they die a year or two later, or there's quite a few of them who die in their, in their 20s and in their 30s, though some of them live very long lives. Uh, one of the, the oldest, the longest living, he lived until 1937. So my grandparents were alive when he, when he was alive, which is crazy to think about. Um, in terms of a few, a few more descriptions of their wounding, do we have time for a few more? Yeah. Um, guys, no, no meanness. My big cat is being meaner to the kitten. Um, they, uh, yeah, the, it's interesting to hear about this having to have second amputations because you think it's it's traumatic enough to go through one, but to go through a second one and all of the risks of infection. Um, and some of them, though, you know, some of them add at the end that it was all worth it. Charles Dodge says, it was a trying period, but thank heaven I am here to tell of it and to add that I am still in the service of my country and still shielded by her glorious stars and stripes. So at the time he was um, in the veteran reserve corps. So some of them decided, chose to stay, even though because they had lost a limb, it was well within their rights to, um, to, to get an honorable discharge, but some of them chose to, to stay on for that. Um, and let's see some other, other good ones. Basically, you know, they're dealing with having been in the at the pinnacle of their 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 powers. You know, they're they're young men in their twenties, um, usually sometimes their thirties. But so coping with going from being at the the height of the prime of their life to being paralyzed or having you know a paralyzed limb or a mangled limb, um, and they reflect on that and and how that feels and. Um, most, you know, though, remain uh, focused on the fact that that sacrifice was to end slavery, to save the union. Um, but I, I'll, I'll end with one guy who had a really difficult time, Andrew J. Fries. Um, so on the 20th, so he lost, he, he, he was wounded on the 19th um, at Chickamauga. And on the 20th, the, uh, or sorry, no. So on that same day, a surgeon took out a piece of the ball that had hit him. So he says it's about the size of the bowl of a teaspoon. Um, and then months later, another surgeon had to take out the, the balance of the ball. So the rest of the ball. He says, October 30th, the main artery slushed off and I lost considerably blood, considerable blood before the surgeon could get a compress on. Uh, the 31st, just as the sun was going down, the surgeon McCann of the 65th Ohio Regiment amputated my arm. November 8th, the ligature came off. I bled considerable before it could be taken up. On the night of the 9th, the lig ligature slipped off again had a hard time in getting, so the ligature is what's tying off the, the, the artery, obviously. Um, but after an hour's hard work, the artery was tied and it stayed. The next morning I felt pretty weak, but soon felt better. I never for a moment was sorry that I enlisted. I was satisfied that I had served my country faithful and was willing to leave the rest to him that ruleth all things well. I was discharged April 18th, 1864. My stump did not heal till last spring. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's something that doesn't isn't apparent for a lot of people when it comes to Civil War medicine and wounds and battles and such. You know, people think about Gettysburg, it's a three day battle, but there are people that recover from those wounds in some cases for years. They're like in a hospital recovering from this or, you know, the case of Chickamauga, he's mm -hmm. discharged uh, like a year and a half later and the wound doesn't heal until either 1865 or, or mm -hmm. uh, whenever the second contest was 67. Um, so the, these, the legacy of these Civil War battles goes on for so, so long. And it's also, to kind of one of your earlier points, it's one of the things that makes tabulating Civil War casualties so difficult is sometimes people die of wounds inflicted during the Civil War years, and in some cases, like the one you mentioned, decades later. Mm -hmm. 
it's just it's inherently challenging <laughs> to mm -hmm. kind of tabulate all this sort of stuff so right and and um two of them in their obituary the obituaries basically blamed their the guy's deaths on their missing limbs because one of them was having to drive his carriage one one handedly and it's and so they said you know he couldn't get control of the horses they went crazy he couldn't get control of the horses with his one arm and so he fell out of his carriage and hit his head um on a on a rock and and so yeah there are some guys who even if it's not technically their wounds it's like the difficulties of of having lost the limb at least that's what the obituaries say there's one guy who lost his left leg in a in a railroad accident later he didn't die from that but it's just you know seems like pretty pretty bad luck but yeah i think it's important to remember i mean even as the the country was moving toward the 20th century these men still were living monuments as one of them refers to to himself and his compatriots uh living monuments to the great rebellion and to you know their their role in it so even as the nation became more focused on reconciliation and things like that they're still uh physical they have fit they bear physical proof of of the the stakes of the conflict and, and their their part in it um, and they're, they, you know, many of them are members of the Grand Army of the Republic and remain folk, or re their identity is very much tied to their membership in this, the left arm corps. Absolutely. So your, your point too about anesthesia, how a number of them comment on having chloroform and some comment on not having chloroform. One of the big things we talk about a lot here at the museum is that over 95% of Civil War surgery uh, use some form of anesthesia, at least 95% of recorded surgeries. So it's interesting that you came across, uh, you know, a few instances there. So I'll be curious to, to take a look at this. I, I know I'm very much looking forward to getting my copy uh, of the book and, and kind of looking through some of the, especially the, the medical chapters. That's, that's fascinating that that showed up uh, in, in some of their writings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, the it's one of the shortest entries in the book is by the guy who's who's um, whose handwriting I told you that wasn't particularly legible, John Bryce, and all he he just says, you know, he was laid on the I was laid on the table at five and a half p.m. past on September 6, sixty two, Armory Hospital, Seventh Street, Washington D.C. Professor Bliss, M.D. I thought Sergeant Gunn of Fifth Michigan shook hands with me, of whom I was acquainted. I then set sail as a vessel sailing through the air. I had a narrow river to cross, which seemed very deep. I got to the top of the embankment and who jumps up before me, but Joseph K, but general, he doesn't say Joseph KF, but that's who he's referring to, Mansfield. I shouted out the general's name. I felt no pain during the cutting of my arm. It seemed pleasant while in the stupor. The title of that I should have mentioned is how I felt under chloroform. So right. it doesn't sound too bad to me. <laughs> yeah, you know, just wandering around and like, ah, hey general, mm -hmm. how's it going? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I know you. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's uh, that's pretty wild. And by the way, uh, Armory Square Hospital, I believe, is the hospital where the uh, Air and Space Museum uh, currently is uh, on the National Mall. So just to further situate that in in cool. uh, in space there, or, well, Air and Space spatially <laughs> located. In, anyway, um, bad, not quite pun. Um, <laughs> So as we're uh, coming to a close here, uh, this has been really, really fascinating. Um, and uh, again, I would encourage everyone to, to pick up a copy when the book comes out in May. Um, I always like asking people this um, because I don't think it's a question, especially that historians get asked <laughs> a lot. Um, but once the book kind of goes out there in the world, what's your hope uh, for the book? What do you hope someone kind of takes away from it when you sit, when they sit down and read it? Well, I'm definitely hoping for a wider readership than, you know, a scholarly ma uh, manuscript of, or monograph about bodies and wounds in Civil War print culture, which is focused very much on analysis and stuff like that. Like, I'm, <clears throat> I, I am hoping that, I mean, I've, I've in my, in searching for all of the, uh, all of the veterans and their post-war lives, I've actually uh, come into contact with their descendants. I've, I've been in, in correspondence with at least three descendants who gave me information and who gave me photographs that are included in the book of their, their ancestors. Um, and so I think 
one, it would be cool for people to be able to, re and, and most, none of them knew that their ancestors had participated in these contests. So I think one, it would be great for, um, for people to be able to find their ancestors. Obviously that's not gonna happen for a ton of people, but, um, but also just to, uh, for a wider audience, you know, who, who maybe is not interested in reading my analysis of a, of a poem, but who is interested in reading a poem written by a Civil War veteran about his experiences. Um, and really just to do what Bourne wanted to do. He called it, he wanted to produce a memorial volume. So something that shared the writings of this extremely unique group of men um, with, the, with the future basically, or you know, memorialize their service, their words, I think it's particularly important. Um, I'm I'm always invested in uh, finding voices that you know have either been silenced or have or haven't been heard for a while. And you know these these writings have been in boxes in the Library of Congress, and now it's great they're online and digitized. Um, but it's 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 harder to kind of get to to get a story about these men as a group if you're just looking at the individual um, digit digitized files online. So I think that this will tell a story uh, and give us, I think it provides a lot of insight into just the day-to-day the -day lives of, of Civil War soldiers, how they felt about their service shortly after this. Because oftentimes, you know, the regimental histories and stuff, those are those become really popular in the 1880s um, and, and later on. But these guys are writing right in the aftermath of, of their service when their wounds are still healing, when their stumps are still uh, sore. So I think that that makes this a unique uh, collection in that way. But yeah, I'm just hoping to um, to bring the voices of the left arm corps to a modern a modern audience and to let them speak for themselves, basically, to extend their left hand in in fellowship, which is what one of them says he does whenever he sees one of his fellow left armed left handed um, comrades. I, I love that. That's uh, that's that's wonderful. Uh, extending the, the the left hand, um, <laughs> yeah. And I I would agree with you. I think that's one of the things that is so interesting uh, about this is you have people that really experience this kind of reflecting on their Civil War experience in a way that many people don't. I, I mean, sometimes people write in diaries, but you think about who the intended audience is for these writings, diary, maybe may to be seen by no one or perhaps their family or letters, you know, being seen by their family. It's not quite as, as reflective. It's more like recounting, like this stuff happened to me. Mm -hmm. But in these, I would imagine not having read a lot of them, uh, I would imagine a lot of it is, you know, this sort of happened to me and here's kind of what I think it means. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, I won't say entirely unique, but I'll say fairly unique um, and part of what makes this so interesting and why I'm excited to read it. Right. Well, that's what I was going for. And yeah, I mean, they, the chapter on politics and patriotism, it's really interesting to read. You know, there's been a lot of studies about why Union soldiers fought, right? So it's interesting to hear from them when they know they're writing for a, a, a public audience. They, they know there's the potential that this will be published. So obviously that can influence how they talk about their experience of wounding and, and their, their experience of becoming disabled. Um, and maybe they're gonna put on a braver face than they might feel or, or to, to cover over some things. But really what I'm struck with is how see, honest they seem to be just about um, how hugely influential the experience of losing their right arm was, but also how much it means in terms of the, the country that they're, they're living in at the moment that they, um, that, and you know, anybody who, who, who makes the whole state's rights argue, uh, argument just needs to read the section on, on, pol <laughs> on politics and, and read their, their descriptions of, you know, of fighting again, fighting to end slavery and, um, and all, and, and really that being, the main issue at hand. Not all of them uh, talk about it, but a lot of them are invested in reconstruction and um, and in the the nation moving forward. It's interesting to read. Absolutely. Uh, just one final um, spot over to the uh, the comments here. Um, 
John McFarland comments that uh, even in the present day wars, uh, wounds take a long time to heal. Good example of a person that many know is uh, Ed Beers, the famous Civil War historian. Uh, years later, he developed an infection from a bullet fragment that wasn't removed uh, in his arm. So that's certainly not a, not a new story there. And uh, Michelle Kroll says, uh, thanks for the program. Very much looking forward to the book and also a UC Riverside alum. So you and Michelle have that in common. I'm from Riverside. Hey, Riverside there we native. go. Very exciting. Um, excellent. So um, this has been fantastic, Allison. Uh, just a, a joy to have you on again. Hopefully we'll have you on a third time, uh, <laughs> whatever. I mean, I'll come back even if there isn't a second volume, but I'm really hoping that this Vol that this volume does well enough to justify just because of there's so many more stories about these these guys that are, I want to tell and and so fingers crossed. Sure. Well, well, I'm sure we'll have you as a uh, a, a multi-time uh, repeat offender uh, here <laughs> on uh, on our video series. So I'm sure we'll have you back eventually. So I'm I'm looking forward to that. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button, uh, hit the share button, share it to groups or send it to people you know or just on your own page. Uh, and if you want to take your support to the next level, consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, we'd love to have you. So. Uh, with all that, uh, we'll be back uh, next week, um, I believe, talking about um, uh, public Civil War funerals or Civil War era funerals and, and rites of mourning and, and all that sort of thing. So it should be very, very exciting uh, presentation. So we hope to see you then. And uh, until then, this is John and Allison signing off. <laughs>